I'm ELD, and welcome to You Can Play Legacy, where we are talking about legacy decks on a modern budget. Today is Death and Taxes, a deck that's been around for over a decade in Legacy as a major player. Here is a list that just top aided a big tournament down in Brazil, as you can see, coming in under a grand for a mint copy. Here's a visual spoiler of that same list. Let's jump in. Thalia, the namesake. Of course, you have to start here. She is what the deck is all about, and the reason to run 60 card death and taxes over the 80 card Yorion and, Ta Yorion and taxes build, having more access to Thalia. You're just going to see her more consistently, along with the mana denial elements. This just makes it, I think, a better option versus the really powerful decks in the format. Things like Storm, things like Reanimator, where you're not necessarily going to be getting to the point where you could bring a Yorion back and have that mid-range kind of grindy action. Death and Taxes is more of an aggro deck. Yorion and Taxes I conceptualize as a mid-range deck. Death and Taxes is kind of like if you were to use a metaphor of like destroying an opponent, you're just like holding them under the water, just under the surface, and you're just drowning them. And they're just so close to being able to get a breath and you just don't let it happen. So they're so close to winning. Thalia, along with Wasteland and Rashad and Port, denying them mana and just making it so they're always just that turn away or just that one mana away from doing something that actually matters. And instead, they just get beaten down by your assortment of threats. Esper Sentinel is a new card for the deck, kind of like a Thalia, but honestly, in my experience, people are letting you draw the cards. The thing about Thalia is you have to pay the mana. Esper Sentinel, if you don't have a Thalia out, I mean, they're going to pay, they're not going to pay for the first one, and they're going to try and play like two or three spells in the same turn and just get them out of there. And it's going to basically draw you some cards. It's possible it'll slow your opponent down, but Thalia is really the thing that does that. So this one's kind of in between card advantage and slowing them down. Mother of Runes is going to protect herself or anything else on board. Notable Giver of Runes can't protect itself. Mother of Runes can look out for herself, and this will make sure that whatever you stick is going to be very difficult for your opponent to remove. Caracas also can protect any of the legendary creatures that you have. At times, Death and Taxes has played even more legendary creatures than it currently does, and this will protect any of those, most notably Thalia. And of course, can be used against your opponent's creatures as well if your opponent's trying to get in something like a Gristlebrand. If that's actually how they plan on winning, they will never be able to win with it. They can draw as many cards as they want. If they can't get rid of your Caracas, they're not going to be able to kill you with it. And that's why you see in Reanimator now Archon of Cruelty becoming such an important card. At times, Death and Taxes actually had an insanely high win rate versus Reanimator because pretty much all of the good targets were legendary. And Caracas was just an absolute powerhouse there. There's a lot more legendary creatures than you might think in the format. Cards like Uro are kind of all over the place, and you'd occasionally be surprised, be like, oh yeah, that guy is legendary, and Caracas is just a tremendous answer at very low cost. Aether Vial is really a key card in this deck. The ability to Vial in a Thalia after you bounce it with Caracas makes it very difficult for your opponent to ever actually get her off the board in a meaningful capacity, and this card just kind of works like a usable black lotus in this deck you just ramp it up you're making your cards uncounterable putting them onto the battlefield instead of casting them at instant speed and really supercharging your creatures for example flicker wisp this card's kind of eh, at sorcery speed if you're just casting this card it's nothing special but if you're violing it in it's incredibly strong you can get rid of tokens on the other side if your opponent has a merit lage for example you can reset the enter the battlefield abilities of your own creatures especially in response to removal you know your opponent tries to kill your thalia you can flicker wisp it out this comes right back and kind of the floor for this is you could actually hit one of your lands and have that come back opening up more mana for responses with something like a swords to plowshares stoneforge mystic one of the best cards that you could be flickering in the list as well triggering that enter the battlefield ability again getting another artifact out of the deck apply beatings to your opponent's face and neck this card just makes things uncounterably good. Like you're just paying two mana and putting something in. Once she's on the battlefield, your opponent's counter spells become increasingly weak as you're just committing to the board in ways that don't use counterable effects from traditional counter magic. Batter Skull, a OG equipment, longtime best friend of Stoneforge Mystic. This card has a tremendous amount of grindy options, returning it during your opponent's end step, putting it back in, and just continually getting card advantage out of it 
And this card, Lifelink, makes a lot of matchups just incredibly tough. Like, trying to beat someone down with, like, Delver of Secrets when they have a Batter Skull is embarrassing. Just not a whole lot that's going to go well when your opponent's gaining all of that life. And if your opponent has stuff on the ground, so help them. The ability to block their creatures on the ground is just absolutely brutal. And that's just when it's a, on a germ. If you put this on a larger creature, then that lifelink really starts to pay even larger dividends. Alter Complete often outshines Batter Skull right now for a lot of people. The Haste is incredibly big, as well as the Trample. This card does close out games faster, which isn't necessarily what this deck wants. Again, you're really slowing your opponent down, so it's possible that Cauldre isn't going to be your best option all the time. You're really going to have to make some decisions here based off of the board state, but if you got to close things out in a hurry, Cauldre is faster than Batter Skull in matchups where the life totals or your life total doesn't matter. Umazawa's Jite, one of the best limited cards of all time, and a lot of games with death and taxes almost feel like a game of limited. Nobody's able to do anything super broken because you've got Thalia out, you're going after their mana base. They're just kind of like playing creatures, things are going back and forth, and that's where this card really shines. The card advantage it generates by giving minus one, minus one counters to your opponent's creatures. It's just back-breaking and, again, not countered with counter spells. And, of course, it does turn your creatures into legitimate threats, giving it a potential extra four damage each attack step, closing the game out in short order. And the life gain is, you know, not a not a bad option to have as well, especially versus some of the decks like Burn, where that's just totally back-breaking. A Lion Slash, this is a new card from... Tamagawa Neon Dynasty, and it's very interesting. It's kind of like a scavenging ooze that you can tutor up, and it actually is a little more versatile in its ability to, to grow, hitting lands, uh, since they're permanent cards. I mean, this card's really interesting. Starts out a little bit smaller than scavenging ooze, but it can potentially get larger as you're not just hitting creatures. Extraction Specialist. Every time a new creature card is printed in white, it's kind of a meme of like, oh, does this go in death and taxes? And Extraction Specialist is the current one that's being tested out. I have no idea if this is going to end up being good enough. This is a card that's very interesting and creates card advantage to lifelink. Often welcome in matchups where your life total is under assault. And it can create some card advantage, bringing back something like a Stoneforge Mystic. We'll see if that ends up being good enough. It's currently a one of. Recruiter of the Guard, certainly a must include here this tutors up anything that you need for the most part and it's actually a good reason why every time new white cards are printed it's so talked about because you can play a single copy of it and have tremendous access to it with the recruiter of the guards in your deck particularly when you're flickering them with flicker wisp and this card can just go get that new silver bullet which might be really good in a particular matchup so including a single copy of a card can really change the deck considerably compared to a normal deck where it's just like, well, it's only one copy in there. You're not going to see it that often. Death and Taxes can find its way into what it needs with its tutoring ability. Skyclave Apparition. This is one that you're playing in multiples. It's just so good versus so many of the cheap threats in the format. And, I mean, getting a token, like, who cares? Like, they can, you can get rid of their Delver, and if they handle it, then they get a 1-1 one, one token. I mean, a 1-1 one, one token is not going to stand up to the type of attack steps this deck is capable of assembling solitude great new printing really interesting that it answers some difficult to answer things like emrakul which previously the deck would have a potentially difficult time against and it's probably the only positive thing i can say about yorion and taxes is it gets to run a playset of these which is either good or bad for you it is an expensive card right now so not having to spend the money might be in your favor but having access to four of them is really interesting it's just you don't have that much room in a 60-card list. But this card does a lot of work, and it is the type of thing that sometimes you get to cast it for five mana. I mean, the game can just be such a train wreck that you don't even have to exile a white card. You're just straight up casting this. You're going to be attacking with a 3-2 lifelinker. Cathar Commando, another kind of utility bear that you can find. Destroy artifacts and enchantments. Great new printing from Midnight Hunt. And going all the way back to original alpha cards here. Swords to Plowshares, the best removal there's ever been. One white mana, no nonsense. Answer that card. They can gain some life, that's fine. I'll be taking it back soon enough. 
basic planes is the backbone of this mana base, but you also have a couple copies of Aganjo Seed of the Empire to have extra dominance in the attack phase, and also Flagstone of Troy Car, something that combos mostly with a sideboard option, which we'll get to next. So that's the main deck. Into the sideboard, we do have Cataclysm, the reason for those flagstones. And this card is just backbreaking against so many decks, getting rid of pretty much all of their permanents except for like a land and a creature, which you can potentially just answer with a swords to plowshares so easily. This card truly backbreaking versus many matchups and earns its spot in the sideboard. This particular list had a ton of graveyard hate from Lion Sash to Surgical Extraction. I don't particularly love this card given that Thalia is going to make it cost the extra mana very often. It's got a Remorseful Cleric, can be viled in for some extra tricks, or just ran out there like a preventative measure Tormod script. Rest in Peace, incredibly powerful Hoser, and probably my favorite for the sideboard to handle the graveyard with this deck is Fairy Macabre. It just is the most versatile, doesn't get impacted by things like Chancellor of the Annex, and kind of answers everything that you want to be doing a really powerful effect it's uncounterable there's a lot going for it so if you're on a budget i wouldn't feel bad about playing extra copies of fairy macabre over surgical extraction for example it may actually be better in your meta march of otherworldly light is a new piece of removal that can handle just about anything notably we don't really get to use prismatic ending because you know it's a mono white deck but march of otherworldly light is pretty close and this card does a lot of work to handle problem permanence Council's Judgment as well, Problem Permanence. Uh, this card handles, uh, for example, True Name Nemesis, which can be very difficult to handle otherwise. Another piece of equipment, Sword of Fire and Ice. This is a hell of a clock, and the card drawing was very welcome in previous builds. Now we've got the main deck, Esper Sentinels, so not as mandatory, and it's currently in the sideboard. And rounding things out, it's got Kataki, Wars Wage, to handle those pesky artifact decks but that is death and taxes let me know what you guys think and which budget deck you guys want to see next as always thanks for watching